I will try to uh, um, explain stuff as I go along a new way that I may have explained yesterday, but I'll do all new stuff today, okay? So um, uh, we have to decide what you want to talk about, and I wanted to talk about anxiety. That, my original plan for today was to talk about anxiety because in um, war-torn in, in war uh, environments or low poverty environments, the main problem that we see is anxiety. Um, so there are other things we could talk about, like we can talk about ADHD, we can talk about, um, well, I don't want to do autism today. But the thing about anxiety is that until recently, it was not recognized that children can have anxiety. And the signs of anxiety in a child are so different than the signs of anxiety in an adult that they were easily missed. So there's been a big, um, there's been a big change over the last couple of years. And I mentioned this morning that, uh, that we have that study uh, reporting 76% of the teenagers in Toronto having anxiety. And the thinking, that, uh, the thinking that happened at the time was that there was something about puberty which was triggering this. You know, the new kinds of social pressures, social stresses that teens are exposed to. But over the last couple of years, some friends of mine in Ottawa have been working on uh, the signs of anxiety in children. And now what we've realized, and if you're interested, well, it, it, I'll, I'll explain enough today. And now what we realized is the 76% in fact was always there. That these were kids, that these teenagers had anxiety that was either not, it, it just, was either not seen, not recognized, or misdiagnosed. And so what we think is actually happening is um, an anxiety epidemic, an anxiety epidemic. And there are a couple of trends about it that we're very worried about. And the trends are that um, it's happening younger and younger that it's getting more and more severe, and that there's no longer a gender gap. So those are our big concerns. And, um, and we actually can see it if we know what to look for in babies. All right? So what we're going to do is I'm going to try, in this workshop, we'll try to work through something called the arousal cycle. To work on arousal, to, to work on anxiety, we have to work on three levels, possibly four. And those are physical, physical, the physical, the biological level, emotional, the emotional level, and cognitive. As the child gets older, we obviously have to start factoring in social. Right, but for little guys, we look at those three. And what's fascinating about an arousal cycle is that I'm going to say this in a very difficult way, and then we'll unpack it as we go through it. With an arousal cycle, you have this, these three elements, biological, emotional, and cognitive, and they all work on each other. The child starts to spin out of control. It's a spiraling effect. It's called a cascading effect, okay? So typically what will happen is a child will present with a problem on one level, okay? So I've got a child who presents me with, typically what we would say is, I've got now a three-year-old or a four-year-old who is very, very scared all the time. 
and the child is so afraid that, uh, that the child won't let his mother out of his sight. Okay? So we say, oh, well, you know, that's an anxiety problem and uh, separation anxiety. And, 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 and so what happens is, is then we start to focus on that specific problem. But in fact, what the arousal cycle tells us is we have to look at all three levels. That's the first thing. So we have to look, we can't just work on the symptom. You work on the cycle. You work on all three elements. I'll explain all this. Hopefully, I'll have it explained by the end of the session. That's the first point. So the first point is you always have to work on at least three levels. And as the child becomes older, you work on four or five levels. So you have to understand how all these things fit together. You cannot just treat a symptom. If you treat a symptom, then what happens is the underlying pathology has not changed. So the child will remain susceptible, vulnerable to, to anxiety, but it will turn up somewhere else. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is turning up somewhere else because there can be problems that you don't recognize as anxiety. So, so the child who's afraid to be away from mommy, that's easy. But in fact, it turns out that the child who turns violent um, with children, with other children, has an anxiety problem. His, here, his anxiety is being caused by relationships that he really doesn't understand, that he really cannot manage. He doesn't pick up nonverbal cues. He doesn't understand, these are called affect cues. He doesn't understand what other people are thinking or feeling through very subtle nonverbal cues. Or he doesn't understand the effect that his behavior has on others. He doesn't see that by behaving this way, he's actually upsetting other people. So social interactions for him become fraught with anxiety. And he, so some children will deal with that anxiety by hitting, kicking, whatever, swearing. And other children will deal with that anxiety by running. Okay, so they withdraw, they'll hide. Um, and so when we look at the two kinds of children, when we look at the child who's withdrawing, we say, oh, well, that's anxiety. That, I, oh, I see that. that, that's easy. But when we look at the kid who hits, we say, oh, no, his problem is he's, he's got conduct disorder, he's got aggression. When in fact, it wasn't aggression at all. It was anxiety. It was anxiety because perhaps uh, for various reasons, I liked what Hida said this morning, um, he's not having those experiences that would enable him to operate effectively in social interactions. So he becomes anxious, and his defensive mechanism is to hit out. You understand what I'm saying, yeah? Okay, so this is interesting, because now what it does is it starts to change the way we look at children's problems. So I have another problem now. So I have a kid who... I have a kid who... Um, can't do math. That's a good one. Hida gave us the example this morning. You can't do. You can't. Nobody like. He said nobody likes to do math. So we have these children all the time. That uh, in fact, uh, a lot of our our cases are kids who become even violent when asked to do something in school that they can't handle. But in fact, what's really going on is anxiety again, for all the reasons I explained yesterday. Because in that state of anxiety, various parts of the brain shut down, and. And his ability to concentrate, his ability to focus, turns off with his anxiety. So, in fact, if I lower his anxiety, suddenly he can do math. We've had this happening over and over. We do very simple techniques. So one of our techniques is the gentle touch on the shoulder. Is often enough for the child who's having explosions or meltdowns to be able to do his math class. Uh, the reason why, by the way, is very interesting. Why would a touch on the shoulder be enough to help a child who just a moment ago couldn't do math? Because, do you remember yesterday I talked about the brain's three strategies for dealing with stress? So the first strategy, the important one, is social engagement. Yeah? When I touch his shoulder, 
What I'm saying is you're not alone. And the brain recognizes there's someone here, there's an adult to, to support me, to, to, to protect me. And just knowing that you're there is enough to bring his anxiety right down. Do you remember or have you ever heard of a guy called Douglas Bicklin? And he invented something for autistic children called facilitated communication. Did you, uh, I'm not sure that that would be known over here. So there was a huge, uh, this was a huge controversy in the US and Canada. Um, he claimed that, he claimed that, um, that he could get autistic kids to communicate, to write, simply by holding, touching them gently on their arm and being there. And so there was like a huge controversy about it. And at the end of the day, people said that he was just making it up. It wasn't a cure for autism, okay? So there's a very famous, a very famous uh, case in North America. Two years ago, there was a girl called Carly Fleischman, and you can read her autobiography. You heard about this kid? You heard about her? I mean, yeah, you can watch the... Uh, oh, you, could, you saw that, eh? One of my therapists was one of the therapists there. Yes. So I can now tell you the truth about Carly Fleischman. Okay. So Carly Fleischman was a 13-year-old, and she had been... Uh, was 13 or 11? I can't remember now. And she had been... Uh, she was a, a low-functioning autistic girl, really self-harming. Uh, so she would beat herself and bite herself and hit her head against the wall. And... She had been in intensive, uh, what's called ABA therapy, which is a very aversive kind of therapy. In ABA therapy, you force the child to sit still. You force the child to look at me. And, you, and so the child is, is kind of uh, restrained, and then they get certain rewards. And um, in the early days, our clinic used to be across the hall from the ABA clinic, and we had children uh, who had been in that ABA clinic coming into our clinic, and they were so upset just walking past the door. So we had to move. So it's, a, it's very tough. ABA is very tough on any child. Uh, so this Carly Fleischman had been in ABA and never got any language. So she is now, let's say, 13, I believe was the age. She was uh, nonverbal. And one day... Um, they're sitting, in the, they're sitting in the living room and they've just had a disastrous session with her trying to get, use ABA to get her to speak. And uh, so the therapist is talking to the dad about the kid, in front of the kid as if she's not in the room. And the therapist tells me the story. So this is one of our therapists and she tells me the story. As they were talking, the kid gets up and she walks to the computer and she types H-E-L-P. Okay, so this is a nonverbal, very uh, self-harming young autistic woman. So my therapist says, you know, we all just sort of, you know, I'm sorry, because she's nonverbal. So then she turns to her and she, without thinking, because of this is the way we do our work, she puts her hand on the kid's shoulder, and the kid types H-U-R-T. It's an extraordinary story. So what had happened was her anxiety was enormous. Her anxiety was just over the top. And um, because her anxiety was so great, it looked like she was nonverbal. But in fact, she was always verbal. She was processing. But then when her anxiety got too high, then it looked like uh, it looked like she was mentally retarded as well as having autism, but in fact she wasn't. And so as soon as they recognized that, then they saw that they completely, they had completely screwed up this whole trajectory. And they began doing self-reg with her immediately. Like um, they got rid of the ABA therapist and we brought in our, we have a self-reg language therapist. And uh, it reached the point where the child wrote an autobiography. Okay. So it's an extraordinary story for what it tells us about what anxiety can do. I'll tell you very, very, very quickly why she was so anxious. With her kind of autism, the world was 
a chaotic sensory experience. So, for example, sounds would suddenly go really, really loud and then really, really quiet. And she once, uh, she explained it was like uh, going through a radio where you're twiddling the dial and you suddenly get reception and then it suddenly goes into crackling uh, because her auditory system was, for neurogenetic reasons, uh, so damaged. And so she was very anxious in a state of heightened anxiety because she was constantly getting frightened. She didn't know what to expect. So when, if we could lower the anxiety, then what happens is all of a sudden your perceptions of the child's abilities are completely transformed. In fact, uh, the guy who trained me in psychiatry uh, has, you know, so you, he died, uh, I guess, two and a half years ago now. And so people always ask me, you know, like, uh, what were his last words to you? And his last, the, I spoke to him the day before he went into his last stroke. And the last words he said to me were, in the 21st century, there will be no such thing as a learning disorder. That's what he said. And what he meant by that was that as we start to learn how to do these things, we can develop technologies to uh, compensate for whatever the neurological problems are. But the key is to lower the anxiety. And when you lower the anxiety, he wrote a wonderful book about this called The Learning Tree. And when you lower the child's anxiety, you find that all of the predictions you made based on IQ, you can just throw them out. It's a nonsense. We always get it wrong. We have no idea what a child, we have no idea what a child's capacity is. But, but just imagine, how well will you do if you had to write an exam and you were really, really anxious? Well, but we're giving IQ tests to a 12-year-old uh, who just having to do the test makes them anxious, right? So, so this is a part of the revolution that's going on today. So um, uh, clearly what we need to understand here is what is anxiety? Uh, and we need to understand why this, why anxiety gets out of control and manifests in all different kinds of ways. So, so strong anxiety will manifest in one child, it could be aggression, another child, it could be depression, another child, it can be uh, obesity. In fact, we have 12 different categories. It's a fascinating uh, area of science as we move forward in this century seeing how all of these things come back to an alarm system that's constantly going off. That's what's happening with the child with high anxiety. What's happening is their anxiety is constantly going off, okay? And this is fascinating for us, and it's fascinating because it's transforming as I speak our views about how we do therapy. So typically, what we would do Say, if I'm working with a teenager that has an anxiety disorder, what I would do is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And what you do there is we're going to try to get them to reframe, reappraise the things they're afraid of. So we, it's a very kind of cognitive approach to working with emotional problems, where we're trying to teach the child or the teen, don't be afraid. Um, it's just an emotion, emotions aren't going to hurt you, and we try to get them, we use exercises, so we were using a cognitive technique to address an emotional problem. But what the arousal cycle tells us is this, our first step should always be the physical. Our first step should always be to turn the alarm off. So our first step has to be to make the child feel safe and secure, always has to be our, face step, our first step. And the most extraordinary thing happens. When we do this, say I've got a teen who's, uh, like the teen I mentioned yesterday, we're working with one who just tried to kill herself. So in fact, what we are working on right now is the core level of her physiology, her, her physical self. The fears, the fears <coughs> subside. They just go away. So, what we needed her to recognize, this I'm, I'm, I'm now covering for you guys that were here yesterday, this is I'm going very quickly over what we did yesterday. We needed her to see, instead of being afraid of her fear, embrace her fear, because her fear tells us that what? What does her fear tell us? Can you figure that out? 
if you were with me yesterday, what does her fear tell us? It tells us something. And I don't care about whatever happened in her past. I don't care that she, maybe she was sexually abused when she was, I don't care about that. What, physiologically, what does her fear tell me? Come on. Say it loud. Her blue area is not responding. Why? You're absolutely right. She said, what it tells us is that her prefrontal's gone offline. Yes. Why? Why did her prefrontal go offline? She's under stress. Good. Good enough for me. So it tells me that if she has too much stress, her gas tank is empty. That's what it tells me. So when she gets, so what I need her to do is I need her to, to, she has to see that when these fixations start, when I start to ruminate, when I start to dwell on this thing that's scaring the crap out of me, what it is telling, don't worry about the fear. Instead say, this fear is telling me my tank is empty. What do I do now? Okay, so let's say, let's say this is right. So, that it, so that instead of being something scary, it turns out that the fear, the fixation, is incredibly valuable. So now what does she do? Okay, so now, okay, so now I, it's called re... It's called reframing, reframing the experience. Okay, so now she sees that it's serving as a sign for her. So now what should she do? Because we don't want her trying to kill herself again. What should she do now? So she wakes up in the middle of the night. She's got, all of a sudden, her mind is just completely flooded with this fear. What should she do? I want to save this kid. What should she do? Like what? You a psychologist? Sorry? Are you a psychologist? Special education. Okay. Yeah. All I learned is that only, as you were saying, to rephrase is only doing changing thinking, feeling, and philosophy. So do something, what could she do? I don't know. Sport herself. Stop. Good enough. Good enough. Okay, so what she said was, she, she, this is so good, it's unbelievable. That's exactly what we need to... But that's what we need all of our therapists... It's, don't talk. Don't... Let's not, not... Not you. I mean the kid. The therapist. Um, don't... You're not going to start to talk her through it. That you, you, what are you going to do? You're going to tell her that... You're going to tell her that her fear is irrational? Of course it's irrational. All of our fears are. But what we do, she said, is we're going to soothe her. How is she going to soothe herself? Whatever works for her, we're going to figure it out. So maybe, so you, here's how we soothe this kid. So what this kid likes, of all things, it cost me, this is a $32 cure. That's how much it cost me to fix this kid. We bought, um, you try things, right? So I bought this little foot massager from Home Medics. And you stick your feet in it, and it's got a battery, and it brings her right down. Now, is it the massage that's doing it, like reflexology? Is it just because I said to her this will work, so it's the priming, the suggestion? I don't know. I don't care. But now what happens is she wakes up in the middle of the night, and her first thought is, Okay, I gotta put my I gotta put my massage my foot massager on, or I need to meditate, or I need to take a bath, or I need because my body is telling me that I have gone on to empty. And when I'm on empty, now the question why did I go on to empty always has an answer. So now what we needed to do with her, this is actually very interesting. Um, why was she going on to empty? So this is an 18-year-old. So she was going on to empty because um, of social stress, social anxieties. So uh, she's not particularly attractive by today's standards. And this is brutal on these young women, right? It's just, it's beyond brutal. And so um, and she is this wonderful human being, sweet, talented, who, who doesn't feel sexy, doesn't feel desirable, all this crap. And, and so uh, she was getting, uh, her anxiety in her case was entirely social. But with my seven-year-old that I talked about this morning, his anxiety was coming from the bloody game. 
plus he had social problems too, he, he was social anxiety too, but um, something is emptying their tank. And so we start to figure it out with them. We have to start to, we have to get them into that zone where they can start to figure out for themselves, you know, so what is it? And I can do this with any child. I mean, we can even do it with three-year-olds. Now, here's the point. The point is that when we start to do self-reg, what it tells us is the first thing we're always going to do with a kid, the, always the first thing we're going to do is soothe. I don't care what the problem is that, I don't care what the problem is that they're presenting. I'm never going to, I'm never going to try to teach because of what you said. In this moment, I can't teach anything. In this moment, the parts of the brain I need to teach are the parts that have gone offline, okay? Um, I did want to show you that video. I wanted to show them the video I showed in Belfast, Siobhan. Uh, do you think that'd be a good time to show this? Yeah. Okay, so this is very interesting, uh, and then I'll explain it, but I'll explain it in a completely different way than I explained it in Belfast. So it gives us a real insight into what anxiety is. Anxiety is low-level chronic fear. That's what it is. Okay, so with fear, we always talk about fear as fear is, um, in clinical terms, we talk about fear as a directed phenomenon. It means we're afraid of something. So we can identify what it is that we're afraid of. With anxiety, it is non-directed. It means that it's just that same feeling, but without necessarily an object of fear. So it's a chronic state, it's an ongoing, and in a state of anxiety, what's happening is, so if you go to the graph, what's happening is you, you burn so much energy that that's why you spiral, because fear is unbelievably expensive, right? So we burn so much energy with fear. So now what we're gonna do is, when I've got the kid, when I've got a kid, three years old, who, who is presenting, so now what I've got to figure out is what is making you anxious? And I have to address this physically. So what I'll do is I'll start off real simple stuff. Is it that I asked you to sit when you can't sit? Do you need, do you need like a wiggle cushion to sit on? Do you need something in your hands? Do you need some time alone? Do you need, do you, remember my case of the kid underneath the balls? In every room, that, in every class that we work in preschool, we create a tent. We have a tented area where the child can go in so they can get isolated. Uh, this is why all children build forts. You know, everybody says, you know, my kid builds a fort. Uh, and um, it is also, by the way, I can't remember who, Rema, I don't know where you're sitting. Uh, it's also the reason why they go on the games. Because what happens in the, it's, uh, because on the game what happens is it's got that sedated effect. And what it does is it gives them the, the respite from, whatever it is that's stressing them, but unfortunately it exacerbates it. It's, it. It creates 10 times more than where we started. And she was telling me about a very interesting problem uh, with a kid who basically can't get off the damn thing, a, a little guy, but I see this everywhere. So I see an entire, gen I, I'm not kidding now. I mean, this is my number one, wherever I go, I always ask the, if I'm working with large groups of parents, and I do only do very big groups, and so I'll have a thousand parents. I just had this two nights ago. And I asked them, I said, okay, so you know, you've all come out. It's a cold night in Ottawa. What are you all doing here? What's your, what's your number one concern? And so mom puts up her hand, video games. So I said, I said to the audience, so I said, okay, so how many of you have got the same problem? And 900 hands go up. So I said, okay, so of those 900, how many of you are we talking about boys? If you have a girl, put your hand up. No hand goes up. This is a contagion now. It's an epidemic now. And um, what they wanted to know was how do I stop it? Okay, so uh, over and over again, whatever the problem is that we're going to work on, we always use this as our starting point. An arousal cycle is always our starting point. To break an arousal cycle, we always start with the physical. So Rayma told me a really, really interesting story. Because the kid in question, what she did was, she couldn't get him off the damn thing, so she says to him, we're gonna, the, they said to him, we're going to go for a hike. And oh, I don't want to go for a hike. Because that would have meant five hours, that would have meant five hours not playing his stupid game. So he resists and resists, but they get him on the hike, and guess what? 
This is actually pretty good, he said. Because what's happening is now we get the effect of the exercise, which is regulating the child. So we've broken the cycle through the physical. So we have to figure out, so this is always how we're going to do it. We always come in through the physical. And we have to figure out what works for this particular kid. Is it exercise? Is it running? Is it something? Is it yoga? Yoga is fabulous for little guys. Okay, but you see the point here, right? So the point is that we break a cycle by soothing the cycle. Okay, so now what I want to try to explain is why this works. Okay? So this is a real interesting video. Um, we have lots like this. It's always the same. Okay, so this, is, this little guy's eight months old. And his mama has a cold. Oops. Okay, so mommy has a cold. I was talking about the two branches of this system, the gas pedal and the brake, right? So that's the gas pedal, and then the laughing is the brake, right? So you're coming back very quickly, very quickly, back and forth. Now, here's the thing. Um, uh, that response is a pure fight or flight response. This is a fight or flight response in an eight-month-old baby who cannot yet walk. And you saw that had he not been sitting in that high chair, he would have spilled right out of it. That's how strong this, this mechanism is to protect. And it, it is present. This is like, for me, this is one of the great breakthroughs of our generation. It was made by a, an American called Stephen Porges. Because it tells us the origin of anxiety. Okay, so that's what I'm going to explain. Um, now, that mechanism, the way the brain develops is from the green brain up. The blue brain is the last part to maturate, okay? So the brain stem, where this alarm system is housed, is fully developed at birth, in fact, before birth. So first he's got his alarm system. Let me just show you this. Just do this. I can do this fast. So just so we have this as a, uh, let's do this one. No, 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 no. Uh, I want uh, this. Arousal cycles, got it. So come on, come on, come on. So, at birth, the orange brain is formed. The next part to form is the mammalian brain, and then the blue brain, which is, the regu which is where regulation is housed, forms last. And it starts to form, uh, we're seeing it form right now in this video. So it forms over the first three years. So what this is telling us is this. It is only by being regulated that the child develops the ability to self-regulate. 
It is only by having, so you saw what brought him back, right? So that's easy, right? We know what's turning off his alarm. He can't turn it off himself because the blue brain's not there. So she has to turn it off. How does she turn it off? Tell me real fast. How does she turn it off? Okay, so she's got to stop the stimulation. That's a good one, by the way. Never, no one's ever said that. That's a very good answer. So she takes, but it's true, right? So she stops the aversive thing. She doesn't blow her nose. What else? Huh? Okay, so we know that the laughter is contagious. In fact, it's a primitive human response. So she laughs, he laughs. What else? Intonation. Intonation. She's using her voice now. This is huge for us because she can do with her voice what I'm doing when I put my fingers on the shoulder. With just with our voice, I'm saying I'm here. I can soothe you. She's not escalating it, okay? And, and okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff going on. So she is the one that is regulating him. And by keeping that, okay, I say this very carefully. By turning off the alarm, what happens is he quickly shifts from survival brain back to learning brain. Okay, so here's a question for you. I don't know how many of you are psychologists. This is an eight-month-old baby. What is he learning at eight months? What's he learning? He's learning some stuff. What's he learning? If you're a psychologist, you should be able to answer this. What's an eight-month-old learning? Think autism. What's an eight-month-old learning? Uh, okay, so... so uh, that's a good Greenspan answer. So, so he's learning social interaction. She said social interaction, but she said it very quietly in case she was wrong. So social interaction is a big term, right? So what does a child have to learn for social interaction? Well, the kid's got to learn language. The kid's got to learn facial expressions. The kid has to learn the meaning of vocalizations. There's an awful lot of learning going on in the first year of life. So... The problem for autism is because, the, because of the anxiety, they don't, that doesn't turn off. And so now what's happening is that he's not getting language or he's not getting the meaning of facial expressions. All those skills that he needs to learn that are being wired, guess where? Blue brain. So if he doesn't go through that, then I get, for the autistic kid, we get a snowballing effect because now without language, every social interaction is going to be stressful. So every social interaction is good because he doesn't know what this means. He doesn't know what the words mean or what the sounds mean. Okay. So by turning off the child's alarm, what she is doing is bringing him back to the world of learning. And she does it a million times. She does it, in this example, she does it every time she feeds him. We now believe that the reason why breastfeeding is so important is because the baby is held 18 inches from the mummy's eyes. It's the perfect distance for a baby's visual system to focus on lips, eyes. He's learning. While he's feeding, he's learning. And it breaks our heart now when we get parents coming in and she's breastfeeding and she's on her phone. Because this is more than just feeding. This is, this is nature's design for, uh, for them to learn. And so... Anyways, it's a very interesting aspect of early child development. So, uh, so, so we have to have these rules, and one of the rules is cell phones off when you come to clinic. All right. Now, here's where it gets real cool. Um, what happens if he doesn't, she doesn't turn it off? Okay, that's our question. What happens if she doesn't turn off that alarm? So... We know there are lots of reasons why that might happen. Um, let's take a real simple one. Why did the Romanian orphans have such bad outcomes? Well, because there's nobody turning off the, there's nobody there to turn off the alarm. So what it tells us is that if the if there's not a caregiver, then then that baby that baby does not have the blue brain mechanism to turn off its own. It's own, nothing there. Okay, so that's going to lead to massive problems throughout life that will manifest in different ways because this alarm gets 
uh, Kindle, it's called. It's called a Kindle alarm. And Kindle alarm means that the child is highly susceptible to having a heightened stress response. Okay. Now, what if her reaction is actually aversive? What if she, if she yells or she hits? What if she's depressed? That's an interesting one. What if what we're looking at here is a clinical depression? Well, we know the answer to that. So I, I want to spend two seconds on this. Um, the very first time I thought of this was with you guys. Uh, probably the most famous experiment in psychology of the 20th century was done in 1976, and it's called the still face paradigm. In the still face paradigm, you take a baby exactly this age, okay? And um, you say to the mother, okay, I want you to play, have a nice play with our, with our baby back and forth. And when I tell you, you're going to stop and you're not going to respond no matter what your baby does. So uh, every baby goes through the same reactions when mother goes into still face. So the first thing the baby does is he tries to bring her back. So they, we call it trying to seduce mummy. So the baby gets really cute, you know, and they do funny things, make funny noises, trying to bring her back, but she's very, you know, stern face. She will not come back. That's the experiment. So then, after not that long, the baby becomes very agitated. So the baby will start, they start flailing their arms and limbs, and then they uh, uh, start to cry. And then if she still doesn't respond, the baby shuts down. Okay? And they go into this state, which psychologists call a state of learned helplessness. That's the formal term, learned helplessness. Okay, so now when you see the baby, the baby looks, um, the baby just sits there. One of, uh, one of our most important clinical indicators is when we have a parent tell us, my baby was unbelievable. I had the best baby. My baby never cried. She'd just sit there for hours, and, and she would happily just lie on her back and stare into space. And whenever we hear that, we think, oh, shit. This is not good. Because that is a sign of infant anxiety. This is a very interesting breakthrough. How do we know? How do we know that this is anxiety? Well, because what Porges did was he hooked them up to brain monitors, and he hooked them up to uh, skin reactors. And what we find is that when the baby is in this apparently apparent state of shutdown, the brain, the orange brain, is going nuts. It's pulsating like crazy. And what's happening is it's an ancient mechanism. It's actually the freeze mechanism. In, that's working here, um, so that the outward appearance is that my baby's not doing anything, but the inward appearance is this kid is using up their whole tank. They're burning the whole tank. They are in a state of really quite acute anxiety. Now, this is fascinating because it tells us that, that it tells us a couple of major things that we never realized until the last couple of years. The first thing it tells us, I, I was actually the one who, who, who was the first one who saw this, and then we've tested it, and, and so what I had seen was, oh, geez. Uh, I had taken videos of kids that had anxiety disorders. Uh, I, I said to the parents of kids who had anxiety disorders, have you got any home videos? And we spent hours and hours going through these home videos, and we saw the same thing over and over again. Little, little guy, uh, under a year, very still. And then the penny dropped, right? So it told us that the way an infant presents anxiety is totally different than the way a three-year-old would or the way a six-year-old or a 16-year-old. And it told us that it has everything to do with the blue brain. Because the blue brain hasn't developed, they don't have those resources to, uh, they, they don't have the brain to express in more complicated ways that they're anxious. But in fact, if you were to think about a snake or a, a reptile, how would they show anxiety? Well, they'd go very quiet. They'd go very still, right? That's what they do. They freeze. And that's the part of the brain that's operating here. 
Now, this is interesting for us because now what it tells us is that I can have a baby who's in a state, literally in a state of um, the baby's very frightened. And we know now why the kid's so frightened. And the reason why that baby was so frightened was because that baby is 100% dependent on the higher order brain to keep it regulated. That's the social engagement system. It's that higher order brain that makes it feel safe and secure. And she has now disappeared on him. So he has gone into a state of utter terror. And he can't cope with it. And so now what's going to happen is that little tiny thing. Now, if she brings him back, you can see how quickly you can bring him back. If she brings him back, he's fine, right? Because things are going to scare a baby. They're going to scare them all the time. New sounds, new feelings, new sensations. Everything's frightening for a baby. But with a warm, nurturing caregiver, what's happening is she's constantly, she's constantly turning off the, she turns off the alarm. That's the point. And, or, or, or the dad does. And, and as the more this is happening, like the more, the, the more his alarm is turned off, the more resilient that kid's gonna be. And so now he's starting to learn and he will be able to go on and, and do this himself, even with stresses that, that are, well, with acute stresses. Okay, so now it kind, of, it kind of changed our focus about what we're going to try to do when we work with little guys, particularly little guys that either have experienced something very scary in their life. And oh, I should tell you this just as an aside. Oh, do, 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 do. So... All kinds of things now turn, uh, our definition of trauma is changing week by week. Um, there are some really, really incredible people working on trauma today, and they're worth reading. Um, they're worth reading even if you're not dealing with trauma. The most important person in trauma today is probably Pat Ogden, O-G-D-E-N. She's wonderful. But um, I, my own personal hero is Bessel van der Kolk. If you know who that is, Bessel van der Kolk has a new book coming out any day now. And basically what they're telling us is that little tiny things that we never suspected were traumatic actually are. So I'll give you an example. Surgery on a baby is traumatic. When, we were, when, we were, when I was in school, they told us babies couldn't experience pain. How stupid were we? Really? Because what happened was the baby or the infant or the toddler goes into that shutdown state. So the twits said, well, you see, look, he's not moving. He's not crying. So he's obviously not in pain. Because we pushed him way past that. We pushed him past pain into, into freeze. So we now know that, um, I, as a matter of fact, just uh, the week before last, I was working with a case of a uh, the child is now, she's 11 or something, and she'd had heart surgery when she was a baby. And what happens, this is absolutely fascinating. The mind suppresses it, but the body doesn't. The experience is every bit as present in the body. So let me take a shot at explaining this for you, and then we'll stop at that, right? Because this is really cool. So we talk about these as embodied memories. All right, so what does that mean? What it means is that all conscious memory, and this doesn't matter what the age, it could be a baby, it could be an infant, toddler, child, that the mind will block out whatever it was that scared you. So whether it was the physical, the, the, the father that was phys physically violent or being left completely alone, being neglected, all of those things, you will block it out. And if you ask that patient, if they come in to see you when they're, you know, like an adolescent or a young adult, you know, did anything happen? No, no. Was your dad, was your dad, did your dad ever hit you? No. It's completely blocked out. Even if you know, even if you know that that was in fact the case, they aren't lying. They're not trying to protect him. That memory is completely masked over. And it's another reminder of why we don't approach these problems cognitively because there is no cognitive awareness of it, but the body remembers it, okay? It's stored, the memories are stored in the body. If you'd like to read about this, Alan Fogel has a book called Body Sense. This is 
Alan Fogel is F-O-G-E-L. Body Sense is all about how these memories get stored in the body. Now, what does that mean? A memory is stored in the body. Well, what it means, I'll give you an example. Okay. So this is a classic example from Peter Levine. So a girl was raped. She was raped as a kid. And the guy who raped her was wearing a red sweater. She has no memory of the rape, okay? But every time she sees a red sweater, she goes into this. So now what happens, it, a lot of guys wear red sweaters in life. So now what happens is, when she sees a red sweater, her heart rate goes, goes nuts. So her heart rate goes up, her breathing goes up, her blood pressure goes up. She starts to burn an enormous amount of energy. But now what's happening is she's gone full flight into an arousal cycle. Because of these memories, now she is vulnerable to fixations. Now she's vulnerable to all the stuff that happens, all the bad stuff that happens in the middle cycle, the emotional cycle, okay? So now what do we have to do? Well, what we have to do when we do self-reg is get her to know when her heart is racing. Get her to know. So we're not going to try to uncover this memory, whatever it was. That's not our job. But what we're going to try to do is she doesn't actually know that her heart is beating at 120 beats a minute. How is that possible, you say? Well, we're all the same. My wife had tachycardia, and it came as a complete shock to us until we finally realized that she'd had it for a long time. So, so what we have to do is now we have to help her become aware of when these responses are occurring. And we're going to do what you said. We're going to do exactly what you said with her. So now what we're going to do is instead of saying to her, well, you have to work through the memory or you've got to do this or that, all we're going to say is, okay, so what are we going to do to Suze? What are we going to do to get my heart to come back down to 80? What are we going to do? Because what's happened is, it's real simple. When these events occur, the child becomes completely tense. Watch the child. What you can tell when a child needs our help just by how they move. If they look stiff, then they're in a heightened stress. If they look stiff, if they walk stiff, if their movements are stiff, it's because their muscles are overly tense. So you don't have to try to, you don't have to become a psychotherapist here. You don't have to try to figure out what's happened. Okay, last thought. What's fascinating about this is, okay, so you can see how, um, you can see how something like rape would trigger this cycle, right? And okay, so it's a bad thing, yeah, we all get it. But the weird thing is that just having the physical sensations of adrenaline can trigger the cycle, okay? So if I, if I am in a heightened state of adrenaline, that can trigger anxious thoughts, that can trigger excessive worries. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so here's what gets really interesting, and now we come back to you. Because the game, yeah, the game triggers enormous amounts of adrenaline. So just playing the stupid game puts the kid at risk for an arousal cycle. So we look at the children, we look at the children, we look at what's happening with 76, three quarters of my teens are having anxiety problems, and it says to me something really simple. Well, they're doing something that's triggering too much adrenaline. And then I stop and think, oh my God, that's modern life. Every aspect of their life. So what am I gonna do? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wake up, and I'm gonna take the kid for a hike or a walk, and I'm gonna say, you know what, we gotta have some rules now because you're eating Cocoa Puffs and that's triggering, uh, that's triggering, it's screwing up your rewards. We have to have some kind of structure. And so what we have to do when we work with our families is we try to explain all this, and we, then we start to give them rules, right? So we're not gonna say, look, go throughout the game. But now we'll say, okay, let's have it that your kid has to earn the game. So if he wants an hour on the game, you gotta do this and this and this. So what we're gonna try to do now is we're gonna try to get them to see that if you stick with this, Right? So I don't know how long it's going to take you, but you, if you stick with it, your whole family is going to be a lot different. You're going to find 
And I honestly believe that um, if we don't start to do this, then the kind of cycles that have been happening in the Balkans will just keep on going over and over again, or in Northern Ireland. So, so what we're talking about when we do this on a micro level is breaking the cycle. And what we're talking about when we do it on a macro level is breaking historical cycles. And if I can break it on the child's level, I can break it on a societal level, okay? So we have enough evidence now to tell us that um, we can, in fact, do this uh, through, uh, I love what Hedda said this morning, we came to the same conclusion. Uh, we have enough evidence now that tells us that um, not only that we can do it through teachers, but that what we're doing now in Canada is something you guys should consider, and that is we're forming uh, partnerships where we have our teachers working with our social workers, working with our uh, anyone, but also working with the police because we want them part of this and working with physicians because they are maybe the worst. Um, God help the child if he has to go see a physician today who has exactly 30 seconds to see him, right? So we need everybody on the same page. Um, and I said this to Siobhan the very first time I met her, and I still feel it, but this is, the, this is gonna be the spark that drives the revolution, right? It's, it seems unlikely, but now we're starting to see that it was in fact right, okay? So keep at it because uh, the need is great now, but we actually have a pretty good idea of how to do these things. And um, be prepared like we are. We've, we've, had a, we've unleashed a, a tsunami in Canada and you'll have it too. Once word gets out that you can do this kind of stuff, then you're gonna wonder how, you know, what do we do next? You start training actually. <laughs> you need more, more clinicians. Okay, so I'm gonna go have some tea, uh, relax, uh, see how my son is doing, uh, and you guys go have lunch, all right? Thank you.